for who? We've got mic levels and everything. You can, everyone can hear me? Great, fantastic. Um, okay, so given the session that we had before lunch, um, I could see a number of you sort of brains just thumping and, and exploding with ideas. Um, so now we're going to get onto a really riveting topic, classification systems and property mapping. Really interesting. I can see how thrilled you all are in the audience. So really good. Uh, so a couple of things before we get started. Video recording, we're good with that. Take as many photos of the slides as you want. I've got no problems with that. Um, that's my Twitter handle up there if you want to tweet various things about me. Um, I'm happy to take questions as we go through if they're essential or we keep them all to the end. If you see that little icon through my slide presentation, if you're sitting there doing your CPD points, that might be a slide you might especially want to take note of in finishing out that. And also, no sleeping. Uh, this is a rule we have from, uh, from Built and RTC. It uh, doesn't usually apply on the first day of conferences. It's normally a problem day two and day three. Um, the punishment for sleeping in one of my talks is I will take a photo of you and I will post it to Twitter. Okay, so let's get going. talking about classification systems and unleashing the power of properties that we can do with those and what, what the classification systems allow us to do. So a quick rundown of what we're going to try and go through in this session. Um, the idea is to give you an idea of the, the pivotal role that classification systems play in controlling the flow of data, particularly inside Archicad. Learn how to logically manipulate those data, that data so that it fits into properties and then understanding how you can extract data from different places to actually use it in your model in intelligent ways. So let's go right back to principles and have a look at why we classify things. Through our lives we encounter all sorts of objects that we interact with every day. We try to come to ways to group these things. So in these objects here we're going to classify some of them as natural and some of them as man-made. We're then going to look at them and think, well, within that group we've got some that can swim, some that can fly, and some that can walk. And within the man waves, we've got things that use pedals, things that use wings, and things that float. That seems like a very logical way to classify things. The problem we start to run into is we start to, we start to then attribute names to these. So we, give them, we call them fish, bird, mammal, bike, plane, boat. The problem is when we get things that don't necessarily easily fit into our classification systems. Is that a fish bird or a bird fish? Mm, probably somewhere between the two. Is that a bird mammal or a mammal bird? Well, we know it's a mammal, but it still flies, so it crosses across multiple classifications. We then start to look at our man-made objects and we start to go, well, that's a plane, but it's on water. So is it a boat or is it a plane? And Nathan normally intros me with the fact that I'm a bit of a sailing nuthead. What do you classify that as? <laughs> it flies, it's got a wing, it goes on the water. Four guys are riding bikes, they've got pedals. <laughs> it's a thing. It's probably the best we can do for it because it fits into all the different classification systems. So classification systems are very important in times of trying to group our data, but you need to have an understanding as to how deep you need to go into your groupings and how deep you need to go into your classification. So you have a classification system that actually has meaning and purpose to the thing that you're trying to classify. Yeah, so that's a, that's a bike, plane, boat thing, I think. Uh, poignant because he didn't get uh, thrown into jail yesterday, so even Donald agrees with me. Make Archicad great again. Uh, classifications are very, very important. So where do our classification systems come from? There are 
a lot of different classification systems out there. Uh, there's quite a few national classification systems. Uh, you'll hear us talk quite often about uniclass. Uh, there's the CAWS, the Common Arrangement of Work Sections, uh, Omniclass. There's some of the older ones that we've got still hanging around like master format and uni format. NatSpec actually has a classification system. There is a national classification system from NatSpec. Master Spec in, in New Zealand has one. Uh, apparently Kim Jong-un has one too. Um, also, we get discipline specific classification systems. So our wonderful quantity surveyor friends use the RICS new rules and measurements classification system for their data mapping. We've then got schema that come into that. So you've got IFC, you've got IFC 2X3 and, and IFC 4 and in, incoming IFC 5. You've then got COBE um, as a data schema that sits within IFC. So they have classification systems that actually are part of those, and we'll get into detail with those as well. You've also got national codes, the construction code. We talk about class one buildings, we talk about class six buildings. We then have structures within that national classification system that look at types of rooms and things like that. So we classify rooms as to whether they're habitable or non-habitable. Um, so it's important that we have all these systems that reflect all that sort of stuff. Um, we've also got uh, government departmental. Um, there's an acronym there. I'm not going to try and understand what it all, all is. Oh, no, hang on. It's the Transport for New South Wales Asset Standards Authority Asset Classification System. It's a bloody government acronym, is the BGA. <laughs> Um, so all sorts of organisations have these systems. We also have vendor classification systems, which I'll put the Archicad 21, 22 out of the box classification system into this, as well as whatever the heck Revit thinks it's using is. Um, Revit classification systems and Archicad out of the box classification systems are crap. Do not use them. They are a starting point, just like the discussion we had this morning about templates. They are a great starting point to start to understand where classification systems come from and, where, and how they get put together. However, classification systems are important for communicating my data to your data to the other engineer's data. And it's no good if I'm doing that using a proprietary system that's based solely on my software because Revit doesn't have the same classification system as the Archicad out of the box 22 or 23. So the classification system, when it leaves the office, has no relevance. So you need to make sure that you're actually picking one of these classification systems that actually has meaning to all the group that you're actually communicating with. So that's why we think that uh, classification systems are imp so important you developed your own system and now I'm supposed to use yours. We see the same thing coming with CAD, CAD standards. Everyone likes to have their own CAD standards but it's important that we have come up with classification systems and we sit down at the beginning of projects to review these and come up with classification systems that are useful for the entire project team. So where we're going, we're going to need some standards. Um, actually, I have, I've only heard one reference so far today to ISO 19650. It's been, been the big flavour um, for the last uh, handful of months while it's been out there. Last 12 months, there's been lots of discussion around implementation of uh, 19650. And this is a great uh, graph that come, graphic that comes out of that standard that talks about where all these standards sit within each, so, each other. So we end up with ISO 9001 at the outer edge of the tree for organisational management and we work our way slowly in to ISO 19650, which within it in the information quality sections talks very specifically about classification should be in accordance with the principles in ISO 22, 12206 part two. Um, reading these standards. If you can read these standards in one sitting without falling asleep, well done. You've done a lot better than I've ever been able to do. Um, who's read 19650? Wow, well, brave people. Who's read the classification standard? Okay, the, the, one, the one person from MBS sitting over here, yes, he should have read it, yep, <laughs> yep, okay, yeah. It's really riveting stuff, which is why I'm going to summate it for you really quickly so that you don't have to go through it. But classification is very important because classification is sitting within this structure. So classification system is, is all about getting your data in a structure that means it works for information management. That information management then works for asset management or facility management as we were talking about before. And then that fits inside organisational management. So as Yoda so strongly advises us, classification is the path to the BIM site. Classification leads to information, information leads to management, management leads to organisational quality. And they all fit neatly within, within each other. 
Now that standard um, outlines a specific framework for how we classify and how we come up with classification systems. Those classification systems start off with the very basic idea of a construction resource. Um, they then have those construction resources used in a construction process, and then they're used to create a construction result. So we talk in terms of a construction resource like bricks and mortar. We talk about the construction process of brick laying, and we talk about the construction result of a wall. From those construction results, they actually define spaces. So each of these are a separate way to classify types of, of information. Underneath the construction resources, we have different types of resources. So we can have information as a resource, um, agents or the people who do things as a resource, construction aids like cement mixes as a resource, and construction products, our brick and our mortar and our cement. Under construction processes, we then have a variety of processes as well. So we're talking about pre-design, design, production, which is most of the construction process, and then maintenance process. On top of that, we're going to add management into that, and we're going to define those all as co construction process life cycles. So that's all about the actual process of actually delivering all of our buildings. Also, we have to understand that sometimes a construction process actually creates another resource, so it might create some construction information. So the actual process of bricklaying creates quality control documents, creates reports on, on the suitability of that, which then feed back in, and so you end up with a cycle happening here within some of these classifications. Construction results can also be divided down, and we end up with things like construction element, construction entity, and construction complex. So the construction element, we're talking down to the level of walls, and they form part of an entity, which is a larger arrangement, so that might be a whole floor or a building. And the construction complex, which that's a part of, might be an entire development. We might be talking an entire shopping centre precinct, or we might be talking an entire, entire um, health precinct with multiple hospitals and things in it. That would be a complex. So all of these come together to form the, the basis around which this standard looks at all these different types of classification systems. So alongside all of that though as well, we have the added issue of properties. And where properties fit into this is actually what we're going to get into very shortly. But the rest of these are classification systems and properties will fit into all of these different systems. Now to understand what a classification system is, we need to understand the difference between classification and composition. And when we start with a building, uh, we can normally take a building, and this is very much in the way we think about things in Archicad. We have a building, that building has stories, those stories have walls, those walls have lining, that lining has paint. So the paint is part of the, is sort of attached to the lining, which is part of the wall, which exists on that story, which exists in the building. The other way to look at this is actually to break it down and start to look at the types of things that they are. And we can say, well, the building has structure, enclosure, interior. It also has finish, and part of finish is painting, and part of painting is the actual paint itself. So if we're going to break these down as to trades or, or materials, we can start to look at things like this. And so rather than looking at it as a part of on that side, we're actually looking at it as a type of in classification. So the left hand is what we call composition because it's composed of different parts. And this side is all about the classification, which is identifying the types of within the system. Two very different systems to which we um, put our buildings together. So the left one we will all be very familiar with within Archicad. It's the right one that we need to get our heads around to be a bit different. So if we go back to our classification system, what we can actually do is we can take all the classifications that are on this and we can start to look at them in terms of a whole heap of different types and ways of classifying information. We then take those and we start to look at what the classification systems that are available in the marketplace are. And we can start with the two big ones, uniclass and omniclass, the UK versus America. Yeah, I know which one I want. Um, so the UK, um, you can see that they have sections in there that meet most of these different classification systems, classification requirements. The Omniclass one seems to go just a little bit further and says that it goes to construction result. Not necessarily saying it's deeper or better, it just happens to have a table in that last one. 
We then start to look at other classification systems. So the NATSPEC, the NATSPEC NCS, really good at construction result and really good at construction product. Well, it's come from a basis of just specification. They specify things in terms of trade packages and materials. So yes, those two, those two classifications, they are very good at. They get really good depth on those, but they're not so good on what the built space actually might be. The next one we look at is the, uh, the quantity surveyors and their RICS NRM1. Again, very good at space and element because that's what they count, that's what they price. Not so good on bigger things like complex and the process and the management phases within that because the quantity surveyors aren't concerned about that when they're analysing models and reducing them. So their system obviously focuses on the issues that they want. IFC, really good at construction element. We have IFC wall, we have IFC slab, we have IFC stair. Really shit at construction entity or construction complex because it's outside the scope of what it's trying to do. It's very much specifically looking at that construction element line. Then we've got the National uh, Construction Code, which is really good at space and entity. It can tell you all sorts of things about what room requirements have and the uh, requirements for certain walls being fire rated and stuff, but it really stays away from telling you how to mix mortar for a brick. It relies on other things to do that. So it's very strong in those categories. And ARCHICAD 22, really good on the construction element and no good on anything else. You don't need to see this information. These aren't the classifications you're looking for. It's important that you choose a specification for your classification system that actually helps in identifying the information you want to look for. So if you have a particular need that you're trying to communicate, then think about which classification system is actually going to suit that need rather than just what happens to be out of the box or available easily to hand at the time. So classification recommendations, these are some recommendations that come out of the standard, out of the framework. Classes are divided into subclasses and these are collected in tables. So this gives us some of the nomenclature that we have to make sure that we keep to. So classes are those vertical lines we had a look at before. Tables are actually the way that we might actually deal with those, so each of those dots. And the subclasses are the way we break those down. If required, you can have more than one table within a class. So within a, cl within a, a class, one of those vertical lines, we can pick more than one table to classify something. But an object can only be of one class and within a table have only one classification. But it can be classified in multiple tables within a class. These are really confusing things to get around. I understand that. So we're going to go through them very, sim very simply. So we're going to go back and have a look at our system here. So if we have, for example, a built space, so a room that we're trying to classify. We've got a built space. Now, UniClass has a table for that. OmniClass has a table for that. Uh, NRM1 has a table for that. And the NCC has a table for that. We can classify a room in each of those four tables if we so desired or if it was necessary for the purposes of that. However, there's no point trying to classify that room as a construction entity because it's not. It's not a wall or a slab, it's a space that's created by those construction entities. So we can choose any of the tables we want and use as many of them as we want from this one column. We just can't start to have multiple columns for the one object. Um, so that's, that's important to make sure that we make that distinction, that we don't go down that road. In the same way that if we're looking at construction elements, well, the NCC system is no longer going to be useful for us. So we're going to drop that and we're going to start to look at the IFC instead but we could still classify something with an NRM1 code and an IFC code at the same time because we can classify two things using two tables within that class. What we can't do, however, is give it two separate IFC definitions. Something can't be an IFC wall and an IFC slab at the same time. It can't be in terms of uh, NRM1, it can't be a footing and a roof. Make sense? Um, yeah, so we can't end up with things like this. We can't end up with something that's kind of got, it's got a classification as a construction result, but it's also an element and a built space using three different tables and three different columns, because it makes no sense. So we need to make sure that we stick, once you've identified what an object is, 
we stick to a single column in this, we stick to a single class. But once we've defined that class, we can classify it as many times in as many systems as we want to suit the purpose that we need to. So thanks Hannibal, love it when a good classification system comes together. So the next thing after understanding classifications is to understand how properties fit into those classifications. So quick show of hands, who's used IFC properties in the last 12 months? Okay, who has used Archicad properties in the last 12 months? Who's used expression-based Archicad properties in the last 12 months? Okay, you're getting less and less hands, that's really good. Who's used properties in building materials and labeled them in the last 12 months? Wow, okay, that's a lot more than I thought. Okay, interesting. So properties, the final classification. So when we take our element and we put it into a classification system, we go through and we're gonna identify the class that it's going to exist in. We're then gonna go down and pick which table we're gonna classify it from. And we're going to go down and pick our subclasses within those tables. And then there might be another subclass below that and another subclass below that. And eventually we'll get down to the level that we're happy with in terms of classification and we'll assign some properties to it. The other way to do that is to use another classification system and maybe not go down as deep in terms of levels of subclasses, but instead define it with more properties. So the example of this is that on this side, we could be just coming down to say that it's a masonry wall, and this is all the information about all of the bricks and all of the things that go into it. But on this side, we might have gone down to a classification system that said it's a clay brick masonry wall. And therefore, we don't need to def no longer need properties that define the clay or the brick because that's already been defined by the level of the classification system we've got ourselves down to. So finding a balance between these two is the important thing because you could have a classification system that went on and on for almost an infinite depth of subclauses to get yourselves a, a very small amount of properties or you could have a limited set of subclasses and actually have a larger degree of properties that fit within each of those subclasses. So trying to find the balance between these two is actually really difficult. So in terms of this, this is a level two subclass and over there we've got a level four with the properties that go with it. So it's important to make sure the level of classification that you get to is actually suitable for the type of project that you're doing and the type of information and property management that you wanna do. So sure, classify me as mad. I'm not gonna read the last line. Um, so why do we use classifications then with our properties? Well, our template at the moment, and we're working on trying to fix this, um, has over 1,600 properties available in, it, in terms of Archicad properties. It's a bloody long list to sort through when you want to find things. And we have all sorts of properties in there. We've got IFC directly mapped properties. We've got our own specification properties that relate to our specification clauses that we have. Um, we've got all sorts of wonderful things about glazing U values and fire suppression types and column fire ratings and the like. So we've got all this information, but trying to pick which of those properties relates to which object we're doing, it can be a massive task if you were just gonna sit there and sort through screens after screens of properties. So classification systems work hand in hand with properties to allow us to refine that down so that each of these properties can be subset to only apply to certain classifications of elements through the project. Yes, I have a big head and little arms. I'm just not sure how well this plan was thought through. So match your loin to your ability to access information. And that's level of information need. I'm not trying to get dirty. Um, so make sure that if you're going to put all this information in there that you can actually have a way to access the information. So let's just quickly have a look then at the evolution of Archicad properties and how we've got to this point. So as I said, uh, back in Archicad 19, we had IFC properties that we were all using, or we could use. And we were able to get into those IFC properties and we could do some mapping techniques on the back of those IFC properties and we could pull some data from our model and put it into the properties before we exported them. And we could also, if we wanted, try and tag those sometimes. So we came up with, we had this uh, IFC project manager which allowed us to go through and you had to understand 
the, uh, the way that the IFC schema worked and what an IFC beam was and where your object's ID was and you had to go searching and put it into here. And then you could come up with these ways that you could come up with splitting rules. And this was as complex as we could manipulate, by the way. You could come up with ways to take other data. You could grab a library part name or the width or the height and we could split it or join it together. And that was about it. That was about the limit of what we could do with this. So as long as the information existed somewhere else, we could kind of push and pull it a little bit, but not a heck of a lot. And usually uh, most of the people that I saw using this were going into here to fix problems with the IFC schema. IFC schema works fine, guys. You just gotta know how to put the information in. So people were going in and, and, and trying to fix the Archicad schema so that they could get type mapping and things working. That was the limit of what we were able to do in 19. Then we got to Archicad 20 and we got the first iteration of Archicad properties out of the box. So Archicad properties out of the box, we could specify as many properties as we wanted within the, within the project. Um, we could give them names, we could make them either option sets or essentially strings. There was a few other options but not many. Um, we could pick some defaults and some drop downs but essentially they were all fully manual. So we gave them all these data fields that we could attach to objects but you had to select each one and each one had to be a manual decision that somebody at some point made. And we could assign them based on the following element classifications. And that's not a classification system that, we've, that we were talking about before, that's purely based on which tool in Archicad did you use to draw this? That's it. So if you used the beam tool, they were the properties that you could use for things you drew with the beam tool, whether it was a beam or a footing or some other thing, or a railing at the time. After that, we then moved into Archicad 21 and we started to get classification systems. So classification systems came in in 21 and we could start to push and prod these properties a bit more and we could start to get a bit deeper with our classification system. Then when we moved into 22, we started to get equations come into it so we could actually write some formulas and some scripting into this so we could actually start to push and pull information so we weren't reliant on doing it manually anymore. Um, and in the future, there's talk about whether we actually need this separate IFC property set anyway. Because what's the point in having an pro IFC property set and an Archicad property set? Can we just have a property set? So is there a future long term for the predecessor in terms of, Archi of IFC properties and is Archicad properties going to take over this? So we need to be looking at what the, what the replacement structure is for this. So the property manager in 22 and 23 then evolved to have still, ha still kept all the property list down the side, but you can see down the bottom here, we started to talk about classifications and the word element classifications left and we got classifications. And so now we could have multiple classification systems within a file and then within that file, we could then assign any of these properties to any classification within any of those classification systems. So we've got a lot more fine detail in being able to push and pull properties to exist with different types of elements, regardless which Archicad tool they were created with. You also got the ability in here, it's greyed out at the moment, but you can see we got the ability to start putting expressions in. So we could start to use expressions to push and pull data around a file and actually make far more of these um, Archicad properties. And these, these expressions were far more than the old IFC split it or join it together expressions that we had previously. So what did Archicad 23 give us? It gave us component properties. Fantastic, something we've been looking forward to for ages. So now in 23, in our building materials, we can take any building material and we can actually assign the classification system to it and then we can have those properties that come from that classification system which was assigned in our property manager and we can have them available for us in the building material to make, make uh, more global changes to what an element properties might be. Fantastic, attribute level classifications. We've been asking for it in the GDC for quite some time. Attribute level properties, fantastic. Nathan was going on this morning about how attribute management is the bane of his existence and I, I salute you on that one, Nathan, it's the bane of mine too. They're exportable, fantastic. Uh, properties attached to building materials, you can export them in IFC and people, uh, quantity surveyors and the like will pick them up and see them. They're schedulable, they're labelable. There's no expressions allowed though, fixed values only. And the properties 
can't be then used in element properties to then feed into another element to populate it. And it's only in building materials, surfaces, complex profiles, composites, missed out. We're getting there. We're close. Baby steps. Baby steps. Okay. Now I'm going to do the bit of the presentation that makes me the most nervous. I'm going to do a live demo. And the reason that I say this makes me nervous is because I'm known for my ability to crash this wonderful software. So bear with me while I crash it. Uh, blah, blah. Yeah, there it is. It's working. Oh, don't you, don't you play Archicad like this? No? It's real. It works. It's real. Eh, yeah, maybe not. Okay, so, so when I thought I was doing an A-Team theme presentation, I may have got a little bit carried away. Um, this is actually based on a real um, SWAT training bunker in America. Um, don't ask how I researched that. <laughs> so essentially, we need to look at classification systems. So first up, we're going to have a look at the classification manager. So the classification manager inside Archicad gives us um, a series of classification systems down the side there, um, and we can get in and change any of the data on that. You've got the ability um, through pre-formatted um, classification systems, you can bring in, there's a whole range of these classification systems, there's XML files that you can bring in um, off the Archicad uh, Graphisoft website. Um, Omniclass, Uniclass, you name it, you can bring, you can bring them in. Um, if, you have, if it doesn't exist up there, you can spend time creating your own XML file as we've done with some of ours and bring them in that way as well. Um, some of the other classification systems we used, we found them as Excel spreadsheets and the like and we transformed them and got them in here. So we use all sorts of classification systems in ours. Um, we've got the IFC4 classification schema in there. So we go through and classify all our elements in our office based on where they sit in that, so whether they're an IFC wall or a door. Um, we also, at the moment, uh, have an exporting system based on the NatSpec National Classification System because we were exporting uh, to create NatSpec out of our model. So we have all of the NatSpec classifications, so all of the specification sections. We had that built into our template. It's very easy, though, to import another classification system, and here I'm just going to go and grab the, the Uniclass 2015 update from October 2019 as an XML file. And there we go. Click, done. And you can see now I've brought in all of the classification systems and tables from that, and I can now go and start to apply it. The difference, though, of just bringing it in from that XML file is that it hasn't actually got any properties associated to it, and it hasn't got any other mapping done to it. There are other ways to import classification systems. You can import them from other PLN files, et cetera. Um, and that can help to bring in a lot more um, depth in the data that you're working with. Um, but for the purposes of today, I'm just going to import it just that one way, and we're just going to have that uniclass system sitting there. Okay, so when, once we've got those, those elements actually, that specification system actually in, we can go around and start actually applying those classification systems to elements. So, oh, almost crashed it. Okay, so there are multiple ways that we can go and start to, to apply classifications. We can go into the settings of any object, and you'll see down the bottom of all of these objects, they've all got this wonderful classification and properties pull out that will come down. And we can start to go through and say, well, and the great thing is this is searchable, which is brilliant. We can go through, and I wish I'd brought my glasses up here. We can go through and say, we're going to classify that as an IFC standard wall. Geez, yours is even blurrier than mine. Good luck. And you can see by, it, by selecting that, that um, classification up there, all of a sudden classification uh, has made available properties, which have all of a sudden started to appear in the bottom part of that dialogue. So we can go through and classify this in as many different of those tables as we want. But remember, we can only classify an object within one class. So think about what it is you're classifying as you go through this process. Um, because now that I've classified that as a wall, I've obviously identified that it's an element. 
it wouldn't make sense to then go through and try and classify it as an audience viewing area as part of an event space because that's a space, different class. So even though the system at the moment will allow you to pick from different classes, think about what it is that you're actually picking from so that the, the classification that you're assigning to the object makes sense. So I'm just gonna untick that. Other ways that we can start to access the classification on this is actually to grab, there's a, a classification drop down on the menu here. But I hate the fact that I've got to scroll all the way over to here to find it. So one of the first things I do with every version of, of um, Archicad that I now start up is I move them all right to the left hand side because it drives so much of what we do in terms of classifications and properties. So I've now moved them over right over to the left hand side. So from here I can start to go in and just like we did before, I can still go through and um, with some basic text searching, I can pull up and say, well, I actually want that to be a structural block work in terms of my specification code. So that's my element description of that as well. So we can go through and, and name all of those like that. Oop. Live demo land. So from, our, so from our floor plan as well, we can do the same. So any of those properties can be easily added to those. And these can all be um, eyedropped and injected the same way that we do any other settings for, for our walls. We can also schedule all of these classifications and properties so that we can actually go through and assign them. So you can see I've got a couple where I've said, okay, I see standard wall and structural block work. Uh, structural block work, where is it? And I've got some up here that are still looking for Standard wall. Uh, structured block work. So you can go through and use schedules to assign those as well. Once you've assigned any of those classifications, their properties then start to become available. So using those classifications, and we can also do the same with zones as well. Might as well show that while we're here. So the same applies to, to, to zones within within the thing. So I can take, actually, I'm gonna zoom this down and get rid of the sidebar. So I can take um, any of these rooms and start to define them within, the, within a zone schedule as well. So it's important to understand um, the assignment of those properties and how classification systems can add to those properties. So what I'm gonna do is, first of all, I'm gonna show you our flush panel door schedule that has no content. Whoa, no, that's way too big. So our flush panel door schedule at the moment has no content. If I go back to our floor plan, you can see that our doors have not actually been classified as anything. So if I classify that as a door, IFC door door, and if I also go into my doors and windows and say that it's a door or access panel in terms of that. This is just for door one. And if I go back to my schedule, now all of a sudden my schedule's picking it up because no longer is it just a miscellaneous object in my file, I've actually given it some meaning. I've given it some information that says, you are a door. Along with that definition that it's a door, it's also picked up property sets that allow it to have all this other information that you see down the bottom here. So it's got all information about its frame, its leaf, its finishes on the inside and outside, its seals, its signage, its hardware. All of that is property sets that have been attached to those doors. So if I go through and assign a few more doors, you'll note, however, that I'm just selecting the doors. I'm not selecting the doors that I've used here as just openings in the wall. I'm purely selecting the doors because I don't want to schedule just the straight openings. So door, door. And enclosure, doors and windows, door and access panels. So now when I go back, I can see I've got all nine doors have scheduled and they've all come in. 
But you can see there's a lot of undefined in there because the properties are, are waiting for somebody to actually tell these doors what they are. So at the moment, they're all undefined because they acknowledge that they have to have a property there, but no one's actually told them what they are. When we start to look at other schedules though, um, if we go and have a look at our door signage schedule, for example, it's got nothing in it. It's got nothing in it because it's looking for doors that have a defined signage note on them. And because I've not given the signage, the door signage property any value, it's not seeing any doors that it wants to take into consideration. So if I go back to my flush panel door schedule and I go back to my door one and I say that this is my entry door, and door nine I knew was my exit door. If I now go over to my door signage schedule, I now have an entry for both of those. And because it's grouping together the uniform items, if I had multiple doors with, those ent with that entry signage or multiple doors with that, with that signage called exit, I could modify the properties here and it's gonna push the properties into all the instances that have that door. The same thing happens then with my schedule here that I have a, um, a seal type. So I might have a weather seal on that door and a smoke seal on that one and skip a few, smoke seal on that one, and a bowler seal on that one. Now when I go to my, my seal, door seal schedule, you're gonna see that I've actually got information there for each of those different types of seal that have been listed. So even though I listed two or three doors with smoke, it's only gonna give me one entry into this. So it allows us to have information that propagates down the system and creates all the properties, but it only creates the properties when it sees a need based on information that you've input into the system. Um, there is one danger with this though. If I go back to all of these doors and I take off that classification system, obviously if I come back into the door schedule, it will be empty. But if I now reassign those schedules, reassign those classifications, because we've taken the information away, it's not gonna magically come back. So if you are using a system like this, which is similar to the system we use in our office, um, you can see now that all that seal and signage information that I've populated is now gone. If you do use a system like this and someone goes through your model and um, starts unclassifying it, I suggest sending them somewhere like this um, or having suitable punishments in place for those that do. Okay, um, so we've got basic, uh, also the similar um, schedule fields that we have in there similar to what we've done before with uh, the IFC properties in terms of splitting and reassembling codes. So if we just go back and I'm gonna have a look at the property manager now, and we're gonna to start to have a look at some expressions and what they do. So I'm just gonna go down and have a look at my, one of my finish codes. So there it is, bottom finish. So we've gone through and we've created a whole heap of properties um, for uh, various finish codes. So we've got a, a, a finish, a finish code and a finish group. Uh, and we name all of our building materials, all of our surfaces in a way that we have um, the specification code underscore a, um, a short abbreviation version underscore and then the description in the name. And what these expressions do is they basically take any of those names and they will split them apart and put the different parts into different fields. However, different, different object types within ARCHICAD only have certain fields available. So obviously a bottom surface only exists where you've got a roof or a slab. Bottom surfaces don't exist for walls. Walls don't have bottoms, they have edges. Um, in the same way that a wall has an inside and an outside and a slab doesn't. So we've had to create, what we've done is we've created these, all these properties here and we've got a, a very simple uh, expression, which is really hard to read on that screen, I'm sorry for everybody. But essentially it just says split the material, um, the surface, bottom surface, um, using the delineator of underscore and take the second part of that. So that we, we've then gone through, but because uh, expressions uh, only work on one type at a time, so we've gone, well, 
First of all, look for the bottom surface of a slab. And if it doesn't have a slab bottom surface, then it's not a slab, it might be a roof. So the next one goes and says, go and look for the bottom surface of a roof. And then when it fails that, it goes and looks at the bottom surface of a mesh, and then it goes and looks at the bottom surface of each other thing through the file. So each of these is an errored out expression, basically, that will just go through looking for the bottom surfaces. So we've done that for bottoms, we've done that for edges, we've done it for exteriors, interiors, and tops. What we've then done is we've created down here a, a property that's just called spec finish, because that's the finish that we want to annotate on most of these. So what it does for each of the different property types is it goes through and it says, do you have a top finish? If you have a top finish, I'll take your top finish. Um, do you have, if you don't have a top finish, then I'll start looking for your bottom finish. And if you don't have a bottom finish, I'll start looking for your exterior finish. So ceilings, for example, we don't care about the finish that's on top of a ceiling. The property information for something that's been classified as a ceiling only has a bottom finish. So when this script starts looking for the top finish to that, it doesn't find anything, it just goes straight to the bottom finish. Uh, in the same way, slabs have top finishes, but no bottom finishes in our system. So it will go through and looks for that top finish first, finds it, stops. Um, and then in the case of walls, it goes, well, can't find a top, can't find a bottom, must be an outside edge, so it goes and grabs those. So that when we start labeling our models, we only have to label that one spec finish property, and it's gonna pick up the right type of information depending on what sort of object it is that we're looking at. So you can start to do just very basic split and concatenate and text join um, expressions in here to actually start to just play with different text components of the thing. And there's lots of different ways you can push and pull this data around. And there's lots of different text that um, you can access to do this. So you can access um, textual information about it. You can actually access uh, unitized information, so lengths, widths, etc., and turn that into text and then start concatenating that together with different things. So there's lots of ways, similar to what we used to do with IFC, that you can just sort of push text around inside a file. Um, the other one, though, that we've got, so for example here, I've uh, got a label here on a ceiling. It's in the ceiling layer, but I haven't actually classified it yet as a ceiling. So I'm now going to go in and call it a ceiling. And now all of a sudden my label, which is too skinny, fancy that, me having something that's too skinny. Um, so it's now able to pick up some information from that property that we've set. And that property is going through, we've got, because I've told it's a ceiling, it's got a ceiling cover covering property set, and it's got a property in there called finished ceiling height level, which it's automatically gathered from the height that that roof is sitting in the file, and it's gone, well, that's 2400, that's the height for that. So I've told it to go and find that data. The problem is my hostage room here um, actually is sitting half a metre lower than the rest of it. It's actually like a sunken lounge room for my hostages. So um, what we've actually then introduced is we've int introduced another thing called our datum offset. So I've actually gone through and said, well, no, that datum offset for that room, that whole room is actually 500 mil lower than anything else. So anything in that room we've selected and, and assigned that datum offset value to. Is it going to take that? Yep. So now I'm going to turn on my my normal string for that and just go back up to ceilings. Scrolling through these is a pain in the ass and I've actually deleted over two thirds of them that we have in our normal template so it's actually scrolling a lot faster. So previously it was just taking the elevation to the link time story but I've got another um, script in here that I've got for an expression here which actually takes the elevation to link time story and subtracts that datum offset. So if I now tell it that that's the that's the expression it should use first and go out. You can see that my finished ceiling level is now going to say that it's actually 2,900 above the, the floor level in that room because that, that floor level in that room is half a metre down. Problem can be is you might be running through the file and you might start to have lots of these values assigned everywhere and it starts to get a bit messy because people start assigning those values in the wrong rooms. Well, we have a graphic override for that. So it goes through and starts to look at Give me, a, give me a wonderful red crosshatch on any room, any objects in a room that actually have a datum set at different levels. Um, we use this for our, um, our slab set out plans as well. So we actually grayscale color code different 50 mil, 100 mil, 200 mil set downs um, using 
these datum offsets so that we can see visually very quickly where's the information being put to put in those different values. Um, other things to quickly understand is the difference between um, thicknesses, uh, between lengths and strings. So um, properties um, can be very tricky, and I just want, just give me the thickness one. I think it's back at the top here. Uh, see, and this is why I really need my really need my glasses. Should be here, string. There it is. Okay, so the only difference between these two, this one is picking up a length, and we've used an expression that just grabs the end thickness of the wall. The other one, however, grabs that length and uses a bit of an equation on it that's called structural unit, which is a really easy to pronounce word, and takes the end thickness of the wall and turns it into a string. The reason we might do this, though, is because when we talk about the thicknesses of walls, we're not talking about something that's cumulative. We're talking about something that actually defines the property of that wall. So if we've got one wall that's 200 mil thick, having two walls that are 200 mil thick does not mean that we have a 400 thick wall. It means that we have two walls that are 200 mil thick. So it's important to understand when you're setting up these properties like this that you understand what the units are that you're doing and how you actually want them to schedule and how you want them to behave when you get them out into the real world. So this is just a very simple schedule looking at all the block work in that, in that file. And it's looking at the end thickness of the wall. That's the Archicad, just the actual raw data straight out of the object. That's my property that's taking the length, and that's my property that says it's a string. You can see they all agree. They all agree that it's a 190, 190. You can see, however, these, one, these two are actually trying to tally those thicknesses. When I come into that property and say mer merge uniform items, all of a sudden, I've got all these walls. The, the straight out of the box property has been smart enough to know, hang on, it's still only, it's a lot of walls, but they're still only 190 thick. This one, however, is trying to tell me that those walls are five and a bit metres thick, which makes no sense. Because you've told it it's a length property and its default behaviour when you give it a length property and tell it to merge them together is I'm going to add them all together. Which is great if it's a length along the side of the wall, but not as a width. So think about the properties before you put them in there so that you know what it is you're actually uh, trying to tally and trying to pull together with those. Okay, last little bit we're going to go through is a bit of a, a, a more depth in terms of a calculation on how, uh, how these properties can be used to actually give you some information on, on, a, on some rooms. So I'm going to take my guard room here and I'm going to say that my guard room, that sounds like somewhere, on, somewhere where someone might sleep, so we're going to call that a bedroom under our NCC classification. And our legitimate business front, we're going to call that, we call that a study? I'd call that a study. So we're going to call that a study. And we can see that that's in here under the habitable description of a sole occupancy unit. Um, our meth lab, because every good home should have a meth lab. So let's take our meth lab and let's instead say that our meth lab, it's in our sole occupancy unit, so it's still in there but I reckon it's probably non-habitable. I think the closest I've got is photographic dark room. And if the police were asking, that's what it was. Um, and then I'm gonna take my hostage room here. And now does that sound like it's habitable or is that somewhere we don't want to be habitable? I'm gonna make it non-habitable. I'm gonna pretend that it, for the authorities, we're gonna call it a clothes drying room. That sounds, that sounds believable. Actually, we've got quite a few clothes drying rooms. Anyway, so I've gone through and I've allocated those classifications. Some of them were habitable rooms, some of them were non-habitable rooms. So in terms of our property manager, we've got these four properties that I've created. So the first one is a, um, a property that I've put in and I've talked, it, this description is that it's the ratio required by the NCC for natural light into a room. 
And the NCC stipulates for a solar capacity unit, it needs to be 10% of the floor area needs to be um, dense. So I've given it a fixed value of 0 0.10. I've then got another field, another property here, which looks at the areas of the windows in the room. So what this property is going to do is it's going to look at the windowed surface area of any zone. So any zone sitting there, any wall that's touching the boundary of it, any window in that, it's going to measure the area of that and it's going to add that together for me. I've then got another string here which is going to look at the ratio of that window area to the floor area. So it's going to take the window surface area and divide it by the measured area of the zone. So that's going to give me the ratio achieved of um, external illumination. I've then got quite a complex little one here. I've actually got two versions of it. So the first one's going to say, if the uh, transmission radio, uh, ratio is greater uh, than the required ratio, give me the text achieved. Otherwise, give me requires more light. So if I leave that one at the top and I go into my habitable room light calculator um, schedule, I can see that my legitimate business front, I needed uh, a ratio of 0.10. I got three square meters, which means I achieved 0.15. I achieved it, fantastic. Uh, my guard room one, which I've been told is a bedroom, it requires more light. But I've also been told that my hostage room and my meth lab require more light but we know they're not habitable rooms. So instead, I'm gonna go back to my property manager and I'm gonna put my other version in place first. And it takes that same uh, script that we had before and actually um, wraps it in another code that says, if the, um, if the NCC functional requirement classification contains uh, the text string, text string 6.2 point, which was the precursor string for all of those habitable rooms. If it contains that, then do the achieved or required more light. If it doesn't contain that, just tell me not applicable because it's a non-habitable room. So now if I push that one to the top, my schedule will rerun and I can now see that my, my hostage room and my meth lab don't need more light because natural light isn't applicable to them. They're not habitable rooms. So I can now have this as an automated schedule that sits in the file so that when people have classified all the rooms appropriately and put it, into, um, put it into the system properly, we can have this as a schedule that we can then use as designers to go through and say, well, that room we need to go back and review. And it can be very simple then to go back to that room and grab that window and I've made that window bigger. So if I make that window bigger, achieved. So now I've got some feedback from my designers that we can go back and we can tweak designs and play with the designs and get feedback using those expressions. So that's, that's kind of the, the simple end of how complex these can go. Um, if you want to start getting into nesting those if statements and things, it's a long, dark hole to go down, particularly because, um, very frustratingly, you can set out inside those expressions, you can set out if statements nested with all sorts of tabulation and everything to make it nice and easy for you to read. As soon as you hit OK, all that space is going to be eradicated and it's just going to run it back to just one long line and it's impossible to read. So if you're going to do the long list of if statements, please take care because it only takes one bracket missing and the whole thing will stop working. So be very careful with them. Okay, so I'm going to leave our meth lab there for the moment. Oop. And just go back. Oh, okay, so legal disclaimer, what I'm about to show you, I'm not allowed to show you, you're not allowed to see this, you're not supposed to know what's going on because I'm talking about things that aren't in the public domain, so therefore you shouldn't know this. So, classifications in ARCHICAD 24. Sorry, can't tell you it's classified. Um, we're hoping there's more development coming in this. We're hoping that uh, 
properties that have been applied to building materials will be progressed further and that we will get them in composites and classifications will apply to surfaces and composites and complex profiles and eventually we'll be able to do things with GDL into properties and be able to move property information around everywhere and properties will rule the world. But we're not there yet, we've still got some work to go, but please make sure that you think about all of these things as you're trying to expand your Archicad usage in the coming year. So thank you, Mr. T. Thank you, everybody. Have you got any questions? One question. A really big stick. <laughs> no, um, look, I think the best thing about this is, is if you can start to demonstrate to people the power that you can leverage off, off classifying and getting, getting properties that actually make sense to, to objects. If you can show them how just that couple of decisions you can make can actually lead to a whole wealth of information um, and the benefits from that, I think it, it sells itself really once you do that. We've got systems um, at the moment that we're further developing with this, that with two or three classifications, you can, you can build an entire fixtures and finishes schedule just by saying, what sort of, what sort of um, trade is it? And um, using some of the IFC breakdown to say, you're an oven, you're a cooktop, you're a fridge. And straight away, you've got all these schedules that automatically populate with all this information in there. And all they've got to do is just some final selection information that puts through that. Um, other things like door schedules, we're doing multi-story developments at the moment where we've got different um, wind and water penetration ratings on every single level of the floor, depending on what their exposure rating is. is. And we wanted to have that information in a schedule so that it could be handed over to the manufacturer as this is the wind rating that each of these different windows and doors need to be. We could have sat there and done that manually all through it, but we sat down and we wrote a quick expression in there that said, check what story you're on. And if you're on this story or if you're above this RL, your wind loading is this or this or this. And it, it took about 10 minutes to write that script. And now we can use that on, on all our jobs to have that one expression self-populate the, the wind load rating for all of our windows really quickly. Any other questions? Look, um, the IFC classification that we use, because of the way IFC exports now rely on a classification system to guide how they export, we use that IFC for classification system as the initial driver of how our, how our models export. But we've then also developed that further to say, well, obviously that then carries with it other properties and other information about what that actually is. So as soon as you classify something as an IFC ceiling, not only does it get all of the other properties from IFC that ceiling should have, but it also gets a whole lot of other specification type properties that we've assigned to it that we use in-house in that um, build all that for it. So the IFC classification is kind of one of the essential ones. Out of the box Archicad, we'll use the out of the box Archicad 22 or 23 classification system and it links that to how you export to IFC. Um, but it doesn't go deep enough, in my opinion, because of the depth that IFC 4 now allows us to go, that IFC 23 classification system isn't deep enough to do that. Any other questions?